Many people in the agriculture industry will tell you that farming and ranching isn't about chasing profit. I ain't never seen a hearse with an armored car behind it. It's a calling, a connection deep within their souls. It's just part of me. However, they also understand that in order to sustain their way of life and ensure a future for generations to come, financial stability is crucial. If you ever gonna make any money if the cattle are supporting itself. But forging a path to sustainability required more than passion. These men had to innovate and rethink every aspect of their operations. The larger farms are going to have the economy of scale, what economists call this economy of scale. You can lower your cost of production per unit by having more of it. Whereas a guy with, uh, you know, half the size of acreage, he has to he has to be a, a much more on his p's and q's as far as profit and loss to to make it, you know. The great thing about regenerative agriculture is that a guy with smaller acreage can historic can make a lot more. You can run 1,000 pound cows as opposed to 1,400 pound cows. Case in point, the South Pole breed. You know that's the optimum weight, and it's it, it's just basic, you know, common sense. You can maintain a 1,000 pound cow so much better than a 1,400. I mean, less expensively than a 400, 1,400 pound cow. So the auctioneer one day we in there buying cows and the auctioneer says, whoa, wait a minute, hold the phone, everybody stop. Go everybody go get a cup of coffee, go go out to your truck and get a beer, go do whatever you gotta do. Wedge, come down here. Just what in the Sam Hill are you buying? I said, well, Harvey, I thought I was buying a little steers, a bull calf. He said, do you realize that not one of them has been the same color? the same make, the same model. I say, yeah, but I can also tell you that them six guys on the front row wasn't interested in them. And I'm paying 15 cents a pound less than they are. And when I bring it back in here April the 12th, because I was buying them in August, I'll bring it back in here April the 12th and it'll bring the same price that they were paying for number ones the day I sell it. He said, you can't do that, son. I said, well, I'm trying. Well, I did it for four years. And every year I made money, every year I paid my note off early. And the people in the office said, how do you do this? Well, first of all, I started stocking at 800 pounds of animals per acre. Everybody else in the business you can't put over 350 pounds of animals per acre. Why not? The grass is there. Why can't you put more of them out there? Somebody named me a weed that has been eradicated by spraying. I said, is there one? I, I, I can't name one. So my next question is, why you do it? They realized that by reducing their inputs and optimizing their practices, they could pave the way for profitability without compromising their love for the land. Pasture management will do as much for the weed control as anything you can do. Their journey began with the land itself. The whole secret to this thing is to make your paddocks big enough to do what you want to do as far as feeding your cattle and everything and giving it time to grow back. Pasture management and rotational grazing weren't just methods, they were philosophies that embraced the land's rhythm. And that's, time is the thing that most people don't understand about this. It takes time. I can't decide that I want to graze this pasture next Tuesday if there's no grass here. So I got to wait till, I've got to have this thing set up to where I know there's gonna be grass. The manure that we keep in the paddock, the cows, stay in that paddock for a specified amount of time. They drop their manure in there and we'll say that that cow will probably defecate at least three times in a graze period. And then all of the microbiology that we've learned is in the soil and feeds on all of these things. Electric fences became more than mere enclosures. They were tools that enabled strategic grazing patterns and improved the health of the land. All right, you go over the top, underneath it like that. Come back through this hole and pull that tight. 
and you pull that tight, you set it on your post, you slide it up, and you lock it right here. And then you take and go this way, and you see I've been a handle here. You go around here five to six turns. And when you finish, you finish at the top right there, like that. This is a donut insulator and I use them. I take this, I put it in a vise and I tie two wraps around and tie it. And that's what I put my cross pieces on to hook my gate brakes into. So I'm not gonna use that one, but I'll show you one in a minute. To do this, you come in here you take and put that insulator here, you put your index finger right there, and then you do this, you pull it to that point right there, you see how it's right in the center of the wire, and then you twist it, put your handle in it, a lot of people tie these wrong, they tie this one into this one, and this one into this one right here. And that's stretching that insulator rather than compressing the insulator together. And they break like hen's teeth. To keep the cattle from ganging up in a corner like this, I run the wire across here from this gate to this gate. I run the, the poly wire across here. This, this hay will be over here somewhere. Do the same thing here. All right, this is the catch pin up here. This is the catch pin. Okay, when I bring those cattle from the sale barn, I put them in this pen and I leave them there all night. The next morning I walk down there and I open the gate that comes out of the catch pen right here, open this gate, and I walk off and I leave. The water's here, the hay is here. This is, this is poly wire right here with an opening right here. That's the end of the wire right there. I've got everything else on the plate shut off, so I'm getting max out of here. I'm getting seven and a half, maybe eight. I'm getting everything I can get out of that energizer. All right, there's several things that's happening. First thing, if you take cattle and turn them out of a, uh, you bring them from the sale barn or out of the pasture or wherever, and you put them in a pen, what they gonna do? They gonna walk the fence. So I put this hay pretty close to where they can't have pass it. I put the water the same way. They, they walk, they'll find it. But if they want to go to that hay, they can't go here because they got to, they got to go around here to, to get to, and they'll learn because they, you're not, nobody's crowding them. They're just walking on their own. So if they want to come from the water and cut across here and go to that, they're going to walk up there. And when they see that wire and they stop and they get this far from it, if that thing's maxing out, it's going to shock them. It's going to be a shocking experience. And you leave them in here for uh, 24 hours, 48 hours, until you go down there and watch and pay attention and see that they pretty much quieted down and they're used to this. They know that wire will shock them. They know everything in this place will shock them. So they're hesitant about getting close to a fence. A lot of our fences, our single wire fences, we do not have a gate in them. We just unclip, uh, turn them off, unclip them, snatch them little t -po little uh, white post out, just snatch, snatch them out of the ground, drive through there and snatch them out of the ground and lay the wire on the ground and let the cows go. And they'll go over it. And they'll go over it. Now my cows, when they come to one up in the air, oh no, uh-uh, we ain't doing this. No, uh-uh. I had a bunch one time that they spent four days looking at that wire up there, hay and water's on the other side. Ain't nothing where they at, but they wouldn't cross on that wire. Uh-uh, we ain't doing this. They, 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 but you take it and throw it on the ground, they walk right over it, but they would not go under it. Yeah, they got to be trained. They just like anything else, got to be trained. That's like a kid. A kid's got to be trained. Dogs got to be trained. Cows got to be trained. The biggest problem with cows in a system like this is not training the cows, it's training the man. You will find out that it is not necessary to have a five strand barbed wire fence on the inside. It took Sammy and I over 20 years to believe in electric fence. Uh, we put a single strand offset 
on our bull lot we had and they never got out again. I've been a believer ever since. There are a lot of things that you learned that they sold me when I started out that over time I have found it ain't necessary. They didn't care about doing things the usual way if it didn't work for them. I just want to say this about these grazing sticks. I know a lot of people make fun of them, but if you learn the information on this thing, if you plant ryegrass and you get a, a, a good stand, You'll have 150 to 250 pounds of dry matter forage per acre inch. So if you take off three inches or six inches of ryegrass, you're gonna have three times that. So you'll have 450 or 750. All right, what that, what, 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 why do I need to know that? How much feed is out there for how many cows and or calves I'm gonna put out there? That's how you size these paddocks. These paddocks are not built just because, oh, I think I'll run a wire there and I think I'll run a wire there. There's a reason as big as they are. The other thing you need to know about size new paddocks is how much does each animal need when you put them out there. Just as they were stewards of the land, they became architects of their herds. I've always been passionate about raising cattle and uh, trying to build a little bit better animal every year by selective breeding and, and selecting the right sires. And... In the bull, I want longevity, low cost, survivor. About that wide across the back and long, stretchy, and got the appeal that I like and the right color. Y'all leave his in them. By selecting cattle genetics tailored to their operations, they ensured a harmonious balance between the animals and the environment. It's all intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Thrifty innovations also took center stage. I scrapped up the pipe, bring the cattle in this alley right here, and they turn and go down through there, and they get down there and they run out of room to go. They shut the gate when they come in, and we bring them right back down inside, they think they're going back out. It's easier to handle them. I'm gonna show you by my latest invention. All this is a swimming pool floaty, chlorine tablet in it. If you don't get a lot of rain to dilute that water, just like in your swimming pool, it gets that algae in it. After two or three days, all that algae be gone. It just kills them. They found ways to enrich the soil without breaking the bank, nurturing their land's natural potential. If you graze the grass down to 90% of its height, roots stop growing for, 100, for 17 days. So that's why you talk about putting the grass on a 21 day or better rotation. The time that's important is the time they are not there. There's two things you can do wrong. You can put them out there too quick because the, because the grass is not ready for them, or you can move them too quick, and then you can bring them back too quick. They also relied on an age-old tool, observation. And it, it had, we put just a little dab a urea on it to kick start it. But every time, and I've seen this before, when when this, when this soil gets to the point that it's, now this is according to Dr. Binion, and this is visual observation. Dr. Binion. Dr. Binion. <laughs> Every time that we get a half inch of shower, it looked like you should hit it with a dose of fertilizer. Uh -huh. Now that was the, the moisture to take up decomposing microbes. This practical wisdom guided their choices, ensuring their actions resonated with the land's needs. What grazers don't understand is the hardest thing for them to do is they do not trust their grass. They don't think the grass will do what we tell them them it'll do. They can't envision today that they don't have to buy a feed. There's so much to learn out there that you never quit learning. The average, average age of the cattleman in Louisiana is probably in the late 60s or maybe early 70s, you know? And so it, as that generation leaves and the next generation comes on, they're gonna be more accepting of, of what we're talking about. Through their experiences and tireless dedication, these men have discovered a path that not only ensures a sustainable and profitable ranching business, but also honors the heritage of this cherished way of life. It wasn't always successful, but in for most cases, it's been a fairly good eight second ride. I'm 
show you anything you want to see till you want me to start pulling off clothes, then we're going to quit. Of course, you get lit up every once in a while like a Christmas tree. It's mostly been poo-pooed on by most people that you tell it to, but uh, that's my supposition. Like the man said earlier, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. 